Okay, I'm showing. Are we good, Dr. Ben? Yes, Mr. Mayor. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, good evening. I'd like to welcome everybody. This is the City of Ellensburg City Council meeting for the evening of Monday, November 16th, 2020. Uh, we'll start the, this evening and this meeting with a roll call. Ingle? Here. Goodlow? Here. Lamb? Here. Lilquist? Here. Miller? Here. Tab? I'm here. Um, I'd ask that we have an excused uh, absence for Council Member Morgan. So moved. Second. Second. So we have, we have a motion and second to uh, for an excuse absence for Council Member Morgan. All those in favor? Aye. 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 I too vote aye, and that motion carries. Thank you. Um, I did not see any proclamations nor um, awards or recognitions this evening, um, which would move us then to approval of the agenda. I move, move to approve the agenda as presented. Second. Do we have a motion second to approve the agenda as presented? Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Aye two vote aye. That motion carries. Uh, brings us to consent. Motion move to, to approve the consent agenda. <clears throat> second. Second. We have a motion second to approve the consent agenda. Um, <clears throat> all those in favor? Aye. 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 I too vote aye. I just want to point out that dueling Nancys are it's just not good form. <laughs> I just um, we miss Mary. She's always making I know. Well, in there. I know. So it's, Mary's not here tonight. So who's going to make the motion? Right. So. We're, the, the rhythm is off. Yep. Um, so that would bring us then to six on our agenda. This is um, a COVID-19 update. Dr. Larson is with us this evening. Thank you. And Launch when you're ready. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council members. Um, as you know, there's been a lot happening with COVID-19 with the governor's uh, proclamation uh, as of uh, yesterday. Um, that had been in the works for a while, and we had been on multiple conversations uh, with the governor's office, with the State Board of Health, with multiple um, other health officers and administrators. So uh, from a number standpoint, we are, and these are numbers as of today, our incident rate is uh, 186.8. I have to uh, have, again, apologize for lying because I told the uh, uh, school districts that we'd never be below 200 while Central Washington University students were here. And I've had to eat those words multiple times um, this last week. But yeah, so we're at 186.8. That's down from 216.9. Again, if you remember that those those dates go through November 6th. So we and I'll I'll talk a little bit. We're starting to see a little bit of an uptake. So if we just took the last 14 days, we would be above 200 again. And I'm back to telling the truth. Um, we're at 208.3 as of this morning. Um, percent positive is 5.5%. Um, you know, if we were just uh, testing more people, that percent positive would be lower. I mean, we'd like to have it below 2%. It's really unchanged from last week. The uh, hospital is still doing fine in regards to uh, to COVID-19 patients hospitalized, they've been very busy with other things uh, over the last uh, week or 10 days, uh, but not with COVID. We have not had any patients transferred from the west side. That is that is the concern going forward as numbers are, are increasing in the state that, that we will become a transfer center for lower acuity patients. That's not happened yet. This summer, we did get COVID-19 patients transferred from Yakima to Ellensburg, mostly due to uh, them not having staff. So some of the things that you hear about hospital uh, being hospitals being overburdened, it's not just how many hospital beds that there are, but it's how many ICU staff, et cetera. Um, we're still doing well on case and contact investigation, but it's getting harder um, to 
keep up with all of the daily contacts. We have switched our Central Washington University students over to the state for doing case and contact investigation. They did do exit testing. Uh, they offered exit testing for all of their students. Uh, the state offered to pay for 200, the first 200 of their students. We did try to get them to do pooled testing because it's much cheaper. There's a process involved with, with that and Central was not able to get um, to the point where they were able to do that. Uh, they did do, and I wrote their numbers down, they did do almost 400 uh, students. And interestingly enough, they did almost 400 flu immunizations. I think, I think that that is because most of those students, parents who told them that they needed to get a flu shot, needed to have a COVID test to come home, they also needed a flu shot. So, but that was a good thing. Um, they had eight total positives, which is uh, less than 1% of the, of the students they tested. So uh, I have been concerned that, that, and I'll talk a little bit about Central's numbers going down, that either the Central students have figured out how not to get COVID, which I think is unlikely, or they've just figured out how not to be tested. This group of kids, young adults who got tested, uh, most of them were negative. So um, almost all of those students have left the community finals week is this week. Uh, and if students, a lot of them, a lot of those positive eight students from their testing last week already have gone home and left the community. The, um, the most interesting data really continues to be the amount of of community spread. So in September, we had 46 students and 55 people in the community that were positive. Then it jumped up in October to 119 students and 136 um, uh, community members from the, um, from the county. This month so far, as of today, we have only have 17 students that are positive, but 101 uh, members of the community. So, you know, we're halfway through the month. Um, I would expect us to hit probably 200 uh, with the holidays coming up. Um, uh, you know, as you know, whether you, depends on how strong you feel about what the governor did or didn't do, but but certainly his message about um, staying home for the holiday, being within your bu family bubble, I think that really resonates. I'm not sure how many people will actually do that, but I think if we can encourage people with uh, stay, um, the spread kindness, not COVID, and really can get people going to, in buying into the staying at home for Thanksgiving, we might not reach 200 cases for the month of November. Um, I was asked this morning to look at our cases um, in regards to where our um, where our positives are coming from. Uh, it's a big lift. Uh, you know, we ha we can tell how many outbreaks we've had. That's in the state database. But to look at um, Look, try to get the data that the, that the uh, Board of County Commissioners were interested in. I have to look through each case. So I've looked through all of the A's and the B's and I'm now on the C's as of today. And I can tell you what, what I found, which was interesting just in the A's and the B's that we had one um, person who was infected at the Sturgis motorcycle rally. So go figure. So uh, that's... Uh, you know, they had a lot of positives at Sturgis. We only, at least in the A's and the B's, we've only had one so far. Uh, a lot of folks, um, their answer is unknown. I'm not sure where I got my disease. Um, the biggest number is family and friends. Um, uh, and then we've got a um, smattering of all different kinds of, of businesses. Um, Twin City Foods obviously is in there. Um, um, and some healthcare, some restaurants, some construction, uh, some uh, disease that was felt to be at the church. The problem is, is that a lot of times, even if they say, 
I think I got it from Sturgis. They can't really say with 100% surety that they got it at the motorcycle rally because they went there, they hung out, and then when they came back, they were sick. So uh, it's going to be a heavy lift to know exactly where all those cases were. Um, the, uh, as I noted, the cases recently are, are amongst um, a broad range of community members, uh, ages, all the way down to two, uh, to um, 93, I think is the oldest I've seen in the last few days. Uh, we have had more cases in the schools, continued slow spread, kind of what you would expect in the community. I shouldn't use the word spread because it's not spreading in the, in the schools. People are just coming into the schools. So, and so far we've still not had any uh, secondary spread in the schools. So the schools are doing a really good job. Uh, if you notice that in the governor's um, uh, orders, they did keep their hands off the K through 12 schools. That's as of today, all of our K through 12 schools in the county have some in-person um, education going on. I think that's a big um, plus for them. I think they've done a really good job in regards to their um, safety uh, protocols. And that continues to take up about 80% of my time to continue to, to keep them safe. So that's where we're at. Central's numbers, like I said, are going down and they will soon be gone until January. Uh, they, they only have 17 students. I think that was the number. It's less than 20 that are gonna stay in the dorms uh, between uh, Thanksgiving and the first of the year. So questions. Thanks, council questions. Dr. Larson, I had a question for you. Um, I've had families asking, uh, especially based on Governor Inslee's order, if they just all get tested, they can still gather for Thanksgiving. Does Ellensburg have the capacity for widespread testing? Well, there's some, we still have the capacity to do enough testing. So if you looked at that, that order from Governor Inslee, it's either, um, have your family quarantined for 14 days before coming over, have your family quarantined for seven days and then have a test within 48 hours. If that's done uh, very with under very strict protocol, that probably would be a relatively safe thing to do. But all you really can tell based upon a COVID test is that you don't have COVID that particular day. So it would still be my recommendation, even in those people that they were, if they were gonna get together with family, that they wear masks, except when they're eating, um, it's still risky. But we do have enough testing capacity to do that. There are some cost issues involved in that because if you go in, currently, if you went in to, to be tested, uh, the insurance commissioner has, still has a proclamation in place that says, that insurance companies can't charge for COVID testing if you are being tested for either you're symptomatic or you are a close contact. So if you went in and said, you wanna get a COVID test uh, because you wanna have Thanksgiving, I think it would probably get coded the same way that if you said, I wanna to go to Alaska for uh, the holidays and you'd probably get a bill. But we are not turning anybody away and the hospital is doing about a hundred tests daily. Thanks. Thanks. Other questions? Seeing none, uh, again, uh, Dr. Larson, thanks for, for the information. Thanks for being willing to come in on a Monday evening and update us. Uh, I think it's important. It's important for council to hear and I really appreciate the information and your willingness to, to share that. So thank you. You're welcome. Always happy to be here. Well, actually, you'd be happier once this is passed to not be here. I would just point out. That is true. But <laughs> I might just come and visit and, and, and speak my three minutes. <laughs> um, that does bring us to citizen comment on non-agenda um, issues. Um, this is an opportunity for members of the public to approach council over uh, matters of, over which 
council has purview. Uh, if a uh, <clears throat> couple things, one to recognize that um, action will not be taken on anything brought before us this evening during citizen comment or non agenda. Uh, you'll have three minutes. Uh, ask that you say nothing personal or derogatory. Um, and also that you give your name, your address, and whether you're speaking for yourself or others. Um, with that, um, do we have anyone who wishes to speak during the citizen comment portion of the meeting? Um, not seeing any hands. Okay, then. So then let's move on. Um, to um, item 8A, this is on page 49 in your uh, council packet. <clears throat> um, this is a public hearing as such. Um, <clears throat> I, there's a script that I need to go through. Um, I ask your cooperation in the following procedure. The purpose of this legislative hearing is for the city council to consider conducting first reading of the 2021-2022 biennial budget ordinance. Public hearing is now open and I do ask your cooperation in the following procedure. Everyone will be given an opportunity to be heard. The city clerk will be making a recording of the proceedings. If you wish to participate in the hearing, you must raise your virtual hand <clears throat> on the Zoom meeting screen or press star nine if you're connected by telephone. Wait until, I've, and wait until I've recognized your request and you have been unmuted. You should then begin by stating your name and ad, an address indicate whether you're speaking for yourself individually or as a spokesperson for a certain group or both. Speak slowly and clearly. Only one person will be allowed to speak at, the, at a time. Your testimony must only address the matter under consideration. Any questions of staff are to be directed through the council. Each person will have an opportunity to address the council for an initial period not to exceed five minutes. If more time is needed, <clears throat> it will be made available after everyone has had an opportunity to speak. Before we do hear from the audience, is there a staff report to be presented? Good evening, Mr. Mayor and Council. I'm Keith Bassett with the city's finance department with your staff report. The budget before you this evening meets the city's obligation to adopt a balanced budget and provides a fiscally prudent spending plan for the next two years across each of the city's operational areas. In reference to COVID-19, the bu budget reflects impacts to the city's finances and operations, but generally anticipates programs will return to pre-COVID operations within the next two years. The 2021-2022 biennial budget ordinance presumes disease prevalence, local economic conditions, and city revenue will substantially recover by 2022. However, available resources in 2022 are anticipated to be 9.5% below the presently adopted 2020 budget level. There is significant uncertainty about the future impact of COVID-19 on city operations and revenues and numerous downside risks. Uh, staff will continue to monitor the impacts to city operations and recommend budget adjustments if conditions require. Before I speak to the additional analysis of the projects and programs in the budget, I wanna walk through the public participation that brought the budget to this point. In addition to this public hearing, council's deliberative uh, and consultative process uh, led to the budget before you this evening. In October, council received an overview of the anticipated revenues available in 2021 and 2022. At your last meeting, council held two public hearings to take public comment on portions of the budget. The first regarding general fund revenues and the second regarding fiscal estimates and programs contained in the proposed budget. Although the process was uh, somewhat hindered compared with the normal practices uh, due to COVID-19 restrictions, the council's various advisory committees and commissions also provided input on applicable portions of the budget uh, before you. In recognition that this is the ter third time the budget is in front of you for a public hearing, I will simply summarize the key elements of the budget. The ordinance before you uh, is a current service level plus budget, uh, invests in strategic priorities delineated by the council. 
the budget maintains service levels for police, parks, library, transportation, community development, and utilities. The budget uh, funds replacement of the city's 17 year old utility billing software. The budget adjusts staffing for street and sewer utility funds to reduce reliance on temporary staff to complete work funded from the stormwater utility. The budget includes funds to purchase body worn and in car camera system for the police department. And the budget funds transportation and utility investments, including Gateway Project along University Way, Gateway 2 Project, which is a Vantage Highway area, several traffic signal projects, including new signals and signal enhancements, Helena Avenue complete streets improvements, Greaser Creek flood control improvements, uh, continue to complete the John Wayne Trail reconnection route, sidewalk repair programs, uh, redundancy and reliability investments for uh, all of the city's utility systems, uh, system expansion for the utilities as needed, including investments for substation um, with the electric utility and well construction and inspection for the water utility. Uh, additionally, the budget designates funding towards community spaces, including continued investment with the downtown park and parking lot maintenance at Rotary Park and Irene Reinhardt Riverfront Park. And the budget authorizes expenditures for additional bus shelters for public transit. Staff endeavors to provide a conservative financial forecast that is uh, reflected in the revenue assumptions that underpin this budget. The budget is constrained by the available revenues. Uh, the budget anticipates the city will receive $6.4 million of grant revenue in 2021 and almost $5.3 million of grant revenue in 2022. Most of this revenue is received for capital investments with funding for transit operations, the notable uh, operating grant. I wanted to highlight these amounts because these are outside dollars that are being put to work by the city. Budget enhancements beyond the status quo service levels are included to fund capital replacement and investments, known increases to employee compensation and anticipated increases in other employee expenses, including uh, unavoidable uh, increases for retirement workers compensation and uh, other cost increases, including um, known increases for dispatching and jail fees for the police department. A list of funded enhancements along with a summary of impacts is attached in table one to the agenda report and available on the city's website. Uh, the biennial budget ordinance maintains the current permanent FTE count in 2021 and 2022 for most departments. Exhibit C uh, of the agenda packet, excuse me, of the ordinance identifies the positions in FTE included in the budget. Uh, there is a quarter FTE increase for police department records clerk position to address the anticipated workload related to the acquisition of the camera system. A few additional hours are included to help staff youth services provided by the Ellensburg Public Library in the summer months. Uh, natural gas utility budget includes funding to facilitate an interim position to help uh, complete the transition from AutoCAD to GIS for their uh, operating information. Uh, the light utility budget includes additional hours for temporary assistance with heavy workload during the construction season and coverage for extended leave uh, for permanent positions. Uh, the budget includes permanent FT in the sewer utility and street uh, funds. Half of each of these positions uh, are budgeted to perform work chargeable to the stormwater utility. And uh, these uh, positions are replacing temporary hours that have long been budgeted for those funds uh, and have been paid for partially with stormwater utility budget. Um, and so the budget anticipates that funding source will continue uh, for the, the positions. I must note that staff mistabulated one of the stormwater related positions in exhibit C listing both in the street fund instead of one in the wastewater utility fund, the error will be corrected ahead of second reading of the ordinance. Uh, budgeted expenditures for represented positions were established in accordance with their respective labor agreements. The budget includes no salary range adjustments for non-represented positions. The 2021-2022 biennial budget ordinance anticipates issuance of utility revenue bonds to fund investments in capital projects 
current forecast projects uh, historically low interest rates will continue uh, through 2021, meaning the cost of debt is low. The timing of individual projects and bond sales will continue to be evaluated by city staff and would culminate with a proposal to council in advance of any bond issuance. The tabular outline of the budget for each fund is included as exhibits A and B of the ordinance. Uh, in summary, the ordinance once adopted would establish the appropriations and positions necessary uh, for each of the city's funds for 2021 and 2022. Uh, as drafted, the budget anticipates a return to pre-COVID service levels, makes targeted investments in city infrastructure and maintains fund balances within the council's policy targets. Staff recommends council conduct first reading of the 2021-2022 biennial budget ordinance this evening. And at the conclusion of the public hearing, I would entertain uh, any of your questions. Thank you. Great, thank you. The floor is now open to testimony from the public. Each person will have an opportunity to address the council for an initial period not to exceed five minutes. If more time is needed, it will be made available after everyone has had an opportunity to speak. Does anyone from the public wish to address council over the budget proposed budget ordinance? Seeing no one, uh, does staff have anything to add? No, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, does anyone in the audience have anything? I see one hand, um, that would be Stacy Hammond. Hello, can you hear me? Yep. Yes, my name is Stacy Hammond. Yeah, I'm here to address two things. Okay, I need your and, address uh, too, class. please. Oh, yes. 308 North Samson Street. Thank you. So I'm glad to hear that it's five minutes because then I can slow down a little bit. I want to address two topics in the budget. One is going to be around law enforcement and, uh, you know, well, your positions in that. Um, and then also the Ellensburg Downtown Association, which you also fund. The first topics, then we might go into a little bit of public health stuff uh, as far as, fun, you know, how you are... Well, I'll just address that later. The first part is I'm glad to hear that you are um, budgeting for body cameras for the Ellensburg Police Department. As you all may know, I have addressed you multiple times that I was threatened by one of your police officers, Tim Weed. I've told you that. Um, and he did it on an unrecorded line. Specifically, he said that he was riding his bike. So he took off his helmet. Uh, Captain Hansberry specifically stated that that was against policy and procedure that he should have been recording that all of their conversations should be recorded. It's actually generally viewed as protecting the city and protecting the departments, not so much protecting us. But in this case, it was to protect himself against the threats that continue to pour out toward me from the city. Okay. Then um, I also have a very well-documented conversation with Mr. Weiner, your city attorney, who I've asked you to also cut the budget for and maybe just not have an attorney. I don't know, or hire out because he stated that, uh, this whole situation was under investigation and that's why you council had not been responding to me in my as i implore you to help me and why your police chief mr wade is hiring these people that go around like vigilantes okay so the body cameras although great for the future maybe my kids who i assume you'll continue to go after it did not help me in multiple occasions including malicious prosecution which is on record as a tort claim against this city why you're not even bothering to reach out to me. Okay, under the guise, Mr. Weiner says of an investigation, which now he backpedals on and says that that's not what he said or was his intention. Is it or is it not the case? Because otherwise, all of you are failing me. I live right here in downtown, and I have told you that I've been harassed and threatened and that I have documentation of that by your police force that you hire and you okay. are responsible for. Ms. Hold Hammond, I, I need you to speak to the budget. Yeah, I am. I was speaking about body cameras, and I'm glad that you're funding them now, but a little too late. So you should, in my opinion, you should cut the budget for your attorney, Mr. Weiner, and maybe find a small budget and get somebody that's actually going to do their job. Two, thank you for getting body cameras. Okay. Second, uh, we'll move on to the Ellensburg Downtown Association, which had a incredibly horrific executive director who was fired, okay, from her job, right, for being completely callous toward conservative and particularly conservative women. You as a city continue to budget and fund that organization to the level of basically their entire budget, a little bit of county lodging funds, 
Uh, but I have spoken to the executive director of the Washington Preservation Society, Chris Moore, and he tells me that all of that funding is coming in all, almost entirely from the city. And the fact that you continue to fund that organization when they have blocked multiple conservative voices in this community, blocks from their pages, if you are going to support that and you're going to continue to line item, budget them money and contract with them, like I told you last time, even though you know you can go ask them, they're available, you're funding them. So it's your job. Uh, Mr. Akers is in communications with the executive director, I'm assuming the interim now, he can find out if it's true that they are blocking conservative voices for no cause. And if you continue to fund them knowing that, then you are complicit and you are fiscally accountable to me for discrimination, okay? That's also a problem. I've asked you to remove that from the budget until they can prove themselves worthy of funds. Prove themselves that they are nonpartisan organization that they have to be in order to receive public money, okay? The other issue just goes right along with the rest of the stuff. Dr. Larson spoke this evening. I don't know if there's any money that goes from this city into the public health department, but Mrs. Lamb is on this council and there has been so many problems, so many problems. The uh, Kittitas, uh, do you do any funding into the Kittitas farmer's market? Because Mrs. Lamb's husband threatened me, okay? So scary. I have all of that recorded too with Essentia Bakery. Why are you funding these people that hate conservatives? You can. That's why you're in cartoon figures, I think, on the front of the Observer, because you are not taking seriously a huge breath of this community that actually drives this community. It is the life of this community. You may be the face, but we are the life of this community. You will represent us, and you will put on the face that we also create, right, from the inside out. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, thanks. Um, does anyone else wish to approach council on this, uh, on the budget ordinance? Uh, Teresa Plume. Good evening. Um, let's see, once again, I don't like to give my address um, I apologize, but um, I'm going to require that people have provide name and address if you're addressing council. Do, do you understand um, we're talking about issues that, I mean, I'm afraid to speak out if I have to give my address. You've actually provided I don't have your any address. way to you... defend my property if somebody comes after me. Yeah, and I really I... am concerned about that. I am. If, if I may, you've actually provided your address at previous meetings. Um, it Council rules and I believe state regulations support that individuals who address council uh, provide name and address and whether they're representing themselves or others. I've heard in the um, county meetings that we don't have to do that. They just ask if we live in the county. I can restate what I just said, and we can go from there. So, so I have a. Uh, I'm going to be checking into if it really is a state law, and if it isn't, then then I would like to be heard at a future date. I want you to go back to the meeting and hear from me. Okay. No, that's fine. Now I said that I could provide a vacant lot that I own out of town, but it isn't my residence, so I don't know if quite I, how that works. Um, if I can get your name, address, and whether you're representing yourself or others. Good night. Thank you. Does anyone else wish to approach council? Seeing no one, um, does staff, let's see, do we did that? Yeah, because we were on the repetitive. Council, do you have any questions of staff or the public? public testimony portion of this hearing is now closed. Council may be now begin its discussion and deliberation of this matter. Council. And for some reason, I don't have the number of the ordinance on my agenda. Oh, it's on. 4864. 4864. Okay, yeah. thank you. Can I, I, I just wanted to comment and, and uh, thank our dedicated team of non-represented employees for for foregoing any raises this year. Um, just, I just want them to know that the council appreciates their 
um, willingness to do that. Absolutely. Great, thanks. So we need, we need a motion to conduct first reading. I move we conduct first reading, trying to follow the instructions, conduct public, oh, I move that we conduct first reading of the 2021-2022 biannual budget ordinance, which somebody just said and I already forgot. 2048. 4864. Yep. 4864. 4864. This is what happens when Mary is gone, but I tried. That's good. I'll second that. Okay, so we have a we have a motion second to conduct first reading of the uh, ordinance 4864, uh, the budget ordinance for uh, budget of city of city of Ellensburg's budget for 21 2021 2022 um, is there further discussion all those in favor aye 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 to vote aye that motion carries thank you and or um, go ahead I'm sorry that's okay an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Ellensburg, Washington, adopting the 2021-2022 biennial budget for the City of Ellensburg, Washington. Great, thank you. That brings us to 9A. This is page 67 in your packet if you're following along. Uh, this is the second reading for Ordinance 4861, the 2021 Property Tax Levy Ordinance. Good evening, Council, Mr. Mayor, Jerrica Pasco, Finance Director. Um, ordinance 4861 reflects the 2021 levy for property taxes to be collected in 2021 for municipal purposes. The ordinance establishes the 2021 regular property tax levy, the 2021 excess property tax levy, and certifies the 2021 property tax levy to the Kittitas County Commissioners. Council received a report on 2021 and 2022 revenue sources for all funds on October 5th. Council also held a public hearing on revenue sources, including property tax on the November 2nd, 2020 meeting. Council adopted resolution 2020-31, declaring the substantial need of the 1% increase of property tax and gave first reading to ordinance 4861 at the November 2nd, 2020 meeting. Property tax collections for the city of Elmsburg are estimated to be $3,355,303.89 which is an increase of $223,771.73 over the 2020 levy. This reflects a 1% increase of $31,315.32. An increase of $73,706.06 is attributed to new construction improvements, wind turbines, solar, biomass, and geothermal facilities. $2,550.19 for an increase in the value of state assessed property and $116,200.16 from annexations. Also included in the tax levy ordinance is $175,000 for excess levy approved by voters in 2003 for the library expansion and remodel. Adoption of ordinance 4861 at 1% will increase the property tax revenue by the $31,315.32. The proposed 2021 budget includes the 1% increase. Staff recommends that council give second reading and adoption of the ordinance number 4861, establishing the ad valorem property tax levy for 2021. Great, thank you. Council? I move second reading and adoption of ordinance 4861. Um, Property ad valorem property tax levy for 2021. Second. Very motion and second to conduct second reading of uh, second reading and adoption of ordinance 4861 establishing the ad valorem property tax levy for 2021. Uh, is there further, further discussion? Um, I do see a hand up in the public. Teresa, did you want to speak to this ordinance? Hello? Yep, I think you're good. Oh, 
Am I here? Yep. Hang on. I was calling my friend to ask her to give my address or not. Pros and cons of that. Like, I'm talking on the city council. Bye, Sarah. Uh, goodbye. <laughs> goodbye, Sarah. Okay, if I may. Um, I hold it. It was. Are you talking about the tax levy? And can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, I had looked in there. And somewhere in that report, I just have one question. There was an $83,237 proposed increase for OPEIU. Do you know what, what that item is? OPEIU? Um, it's one of the um, representatives, but I would need to ask staff exactly who that is. Okay, and then the uh, 59,159, 2.26% uh, uh, proportion, I think of that for Teamster Police. Are all of our police officers Teamsters, do you know? Um, I believe yeah, all of the police officers are, yes. Okay, thank you. And oh, it was Teresa Plu 140 Woodhouse Loop, sorry. Thank you. Um, and looks like Stacy has a hand up. <clears throat> Um, well, you know, I'm just going to look, I'm, I'm not even, I'm speaking, I guess, uh, for myself and on behalf of all the property uh, owners in Kittita or in the city of Ellensburg, I assume. Uh, I don't know. I, I'm again, Stacy, I need name, if I may just name oh, that. Oh yeah, no, this is Stacy Hammond. This is Stacy. This is Stacy Hammond at 308 North Sampson Street, which I totally understand Thank being you. afraid, by the way, of the address thing because somebody threw a bunch of member Mary Morgan uh, real estate cards in my yard, tons of them, like littered my yard inside my fence line with her laminated guards. So I understand not wanting to, you know, give your address. But anyway, I'm going to speak on behalf of all the property owners that aren't here tonight, or um, anyone that may be listening and afraid to speak up or give their address or whatever. Um, I'm not a property owner. Thankfully, I have a really wonderful, awesome landlord. But I will say that just reaching into the public's pockets to fill your budget because you can't find another way shows poor leadership. People cannot even eat. And you have just increased $260,000 on the backs of the people. Why Mrs. Lamb has multiple positions. She's here. She's there. She's regulating it. I don't even know if she's a property owner, but regulating into the public in multiple sectors. Miss Lilliquist, Maybe she can afford it. Not everyone can, okay? I don't know about you guys, but not everyone can afford to have their property driven up right now. It is winter. It is scary, okay? And you think this is a good idea? This is going to create incredible division in this community when they find out they're, when they're receiving these notices. They hate you guys. They're so mad. And that's not helping the division that you say you want to go away. Find another way. Find another way. And if you're not good at your job, seven of you, however many there are, Find somebody else to replace you that can look for other ways and be creative, fundraise, whatever it takes. Get people that have money to cover it, not force anybody that's been here for 200 years to start coughing it up. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wish to approach council on this matter? We have a motion and second to adopt, uh, conduct second reading and adoption of ordinance uh, 4861. Any further discussion? If the clerk would call the roll. Ingle? Aye. Goodlow? Aye. Lamb? Aye. Lilquist? Aye. Miller? Aye. Katz? Aye. Motion carries. An ordinance of the City Council of the City of Ellensburg, Washington, levying property taxes for the City of Ellensburg for the fiscal year commencing January 1, 2021, on all property in said city, which is subject to taxation for the purpose of paying sufficient revenue to carry on general operations, recognize voter approved levies, and pay debt service obligations of said city as required by law. Thank you. That brings us to 9B. Uh, we're on page 71 in the packet. This is ordinance 4862, a second reading, amending uh, Ellensburg City Code section 1.30.640. I'm Jerrica Pasco, finance director again. Um, state statute requires all elective and appointed officers of code cities provide official bonds. It is also in the city's best interest to have certain officers and employees of the city bonded to ensure the faithful performance of their offices. 
the city currently requires the city manager, finance director, city clerk, city attorney, and chief of police to be bonded. The city is also a member of the Washington Cities Insurance Authority or WCIA, a self-insured risk pool of Washington cities and special purpose districts. WCIA provides the city with crime and fidelity insurance coverage, which includes faithful performance of duty coverage for city officials and employees. The crime and fidelity policy coverage has insurance limits in the amount of $2.5 million and the Washington State Auditor's Office has deemed this policy sufficient to satisfy the legal requirements in lieu of bonding of public officials and employees. Council gave first reading to ordinance number 4862 at the November 2nd meeting. Ordinance 4862 amends city code to allow policy um, of insurance covering honest and faithful performance of duties by officers and insuring against the same perils as a bond to be utilized in lieu of any such bonds. The city will save approximately $1,350 a year by deeming the current insurance policy by WCIA sufficient to satisfy the legal requirements in lieu of bonding. Staff recommends council give second reading and adoption of ordinance number 4862 amending Ellensburg City Code 1.30.640. Thank you, council. I'll move second reading and adoption of ordinance. Uh, well, I think I got off. 4862. 4862. There it is. I'll second. We have a motion second to conduct second reading and adoption of ordinance 4862 amending uh, Ellensburg City Code 1.30.640. Any further discussion? Just comment for the record, state the obvious that we are actually saving the taxpayers money in this action. So. We all appreciate that. Yep, thank you. Um, we have a hand raised in the audience. Yeah, this is Stacy Hammond, 308 North Sampson Street. You know, this would be a place where I would step in and say, don't do this, because for $1,300 in comparison to the $230,000 you're charging the taxpayers, the taxpayers want you to go ahead and keep paying that $1,300 because, for instance, my tort claim against the city is $33 million. So the 2.5 isn't really going to cover it, is it? You're only bonding your chief of police. Not, I mean, look at all the rest of the officers doing their egregious behaviors or, or anybody else. I would highly suggest not cutting $1,000 from your community to save you a little bit of money for something that's going to protect you. I guarantee you in the dang near future, right? <laughs> this is not a joke. So please don't drop the $1,300 and have your insurance companies handle what's happened in this community so we can clean it up for cheap. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, we have a motion second to conduct second reading and adoption of ordinance 4862. Is there any further discussion? All, uh, the clerk would call the roll. Engel. Aye. Goodlow. Aye. Lamb. Aye. Lilquist. Aye. Miller. Aye. Tab. Aye. Motion carries. An ordinance of the City Council of the City of Ellensburg, Washington, relating to Title I organization, administration, and personnel, and amending Section 1.30.640 of the Ellensburg City Code. Thank you. Uh, that brings us to 9C. This is page 75 in your packet. It is uh, to conduct second reading uh, to repeal Chapter 5.64 of the Ellensburg City Code, the carryout bag regulations. There we go. Can you hear me? Yep. Um, yes. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, City Council, Ryan Liskey, Public Works and Utilities Director. Um, during the 2020 Washington State Legislative Session, the legislature enacted a gross substitute bill 5523, codified as Chapter 70A.530 RCW, which implemented a ban on single use plastic bags, a fee for certain carry out paper bags and for reusable carry out plastic bags of a certain thickness made of recycled content and added criteria for compostable and reusable bags. It also includes a provision permitting local regulations of carry out bags, resulting in a need to repeal chapter 5.64 of the Ellensburg City Code. Staff recommends City Council conduct second reading and adoption of ordinance 4863, which would repeal chapter 5.64 of the Ellensburg City Code carry out bag carry out bag regulations 
The council held first reading of ordinance 4863 at their November 2nd, 2020 meeting. Great, thank you. Uh, council. Mayor, I move second reading and adoption of ordinance 4863 relating to plastic and recyclable paper carry out bags. We're here in chapter five, six, four, carry out bag regulation. Code. Good. Second. We have, we have a motion and second to uh, conduct second reading and adoption of ordinance 4863, uh, repealing chapter 5.64 of the Ellensburg City Code carry out bag regulations. So further discussion. Can, can I just say that even though I like Ellensburg's plan better than the state's, the state didn't really give us an option. Uh, that would seem to be accurate. Yeah. Um, is further comment? All the, uh, clerk would call the roll. Engel. Aye. Goodlow. Aye. Lamb. Aye. Lilquist. Aye. Miller. Aye. Tab. All right, the motion carries. An ordinance of the city council of the city of Ellensburg, Washington relating to plastic and recyclable paper carry out bags and repealing chapter 5.64 carry out bag regulation of the Ellensburg city code. Great, thank you. We're now on 9D, this is page 80. It's a proposed, proposed ordinance amending Ellensburg city code chapter 2.32 deferred compensation plan. Eric Pasco Finance Department again. Um, Ordinance 3281 established a deferred compensation plan and trust to provide ter deferred compensation as a benefit for eligible employees and their beneficiaries. A copy of the deferred compensation plan and policy is maintained in the office of the city clerk. There is a deferred compensation plan committee which consists of three persons appointed by the city manager. The committee members administer the deferred compensation plan. Current city code lists Great West Life Assurance Company and ICMA Retirement Trust as administrative agents for the plan. However, over the years, Great West Life Assurance Company has changed to empower retirement and the city has added the Washington State Department of Retirement Systems deferred comp plan to our agent list as well. The proposed ordinance amends city code to allow for changes in the names of the administrative agents for the plan as well as additional administrative agents approved by the Deferred Compensation Committee. The proposed ordinance also amends Ellensburg City Code Section 2.32.160 and repeals Section 2.32.200 to allow for changes in accounting policies and definitions in which the word fund is used. Staff recommends council conduct first reading of the proposed ordinance amending Ellensburg City Code Chapter 2.32 and repealing Section 2.32.200. Thank you, council. Questions? So um, I'll <clears throat> entertain a motion to conduct first reading of uh, ordinance 4865 amending Ellensburg City Code chapter 2.32 deferred compensation plan and repealing Ellensburg City Code section 2.32.200. I so move. Second. Yeah. We have a motion and second to conduct first reading of ordinance 4865. Is there any further discussion? Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye, two vote aye, that motion carries. Uh, if the clerk would read the ordinance. An ordinance of the City Council of the City of Ellensburg, Washington relating to Title II Management and Finance and amending sections 2.32.040 and 2.32.160 and repealing section 2.32.200 of the Ellensburg City Code. That was a numbers test, Beth. Thank you, you did well. <laughs> that, was, that, was, that was just remarkable, thank you. Um, so that would bring us then to 10A. 10A is uh, the call for temporary artwork installation at Rotary Pavilion. Uh, we're on page 85 in your packet. And I'm not sure who's doing the report. I can do the first part of the report and get us up to date. And then um, there's a member from the Arts Commission that's coming to take it from there. So I just want to make sure he's unmuted, Gerald. Yeah, okay. There, I okay. Here. Good deal. So um, to bring us up to speed, just previous council action, the subcommittee of council member Miller and Lamb and I um, 
brought a recommendation to you to create a call for artwork. Then we uh, moved that to the Arts Commission um, to take the action from there. The Arts Commission met in a special meeting and um, had some recommendations for the City Council, but in order for the council to um, in what they felt for it to be a successful project. So, and for us to achieve the goals that we told them were the goals. And um, those recommendations uh, changed the nature of the project enough that we felt the need to bring it back to council uh, for approval. So they put together the former call for artwork and um, through a meeting, they have their own subcommittee and so Jerry is part of that subcommittee. And so he's gonna tell you from that point, um, I was no longer participating in the meeting. So he's gonna update us on what happened in that subcommittee and then how it got back to us tonight. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so uh, good evening council, Jerry Doherty from the Ellensburg Arts Commission. Uh, just to kind of bring you up to speed with where we are with the call for art. Um, the, the first meeting that the public art work group had uh, was back on September 29th, where we kind of roughed in the proposal, the call for art. Um, after that, we had our October commission meeting, which the October 22nd public meeting that uh, Stacy alluded to uh, when we, we put that into motion and planned that. Um, since then, the public art committee went, we met at the site and after meeting at the site down, um, down at the pavilion and, and looking around, um, we, we kind of started to think that there's a lot more potential than just windows here. And so we incorporated that into a broader call for art. Um, we brought that to the commission and simultaneously put that in to the council's agenda. And that is in your agenda packet for this evening's meeting. Um, just a couple of the things that I think are worth pointing out, the process for selecting artists in the piece um, are rooted in the policy that was adopted last November as part of the city's public art policy. So what we're doing here falls within the, the public art acquisition policy that was adopted as part of 2019-32 um, last November. Um, and we went looking for some common language to use so that we could talk about um, what a piece of public art that talks about um, racial equity uh, looks like. And so what we landed on was a document from the local and regional government alliance on race and equity. And they have a pretty good um, they have a pretty good glossary of terms. And so those are the terms that we used when we incorporated uh, language into the call for art. The, we're ready to send the call out uh, pending the outcome of tonight's meeting. And we are excited to, to make this happen uh, as soon as we can. Um, and I'm here to answer any other questions that you may have uh, beyond that. Great, thank you. Um, Council, questions of uh, either the subcommittee or Jerry? So it's my understanding that the change, uh, Stacy, is instead of focusing on the windows only of the Welcome Center, they want to be able to use the whole Rotary Pavilion area if, if a good proposal comes in for a different kind of project is that okay thanks I, I wanted to ask so um the panelists who would be selecting the the finalists for the for the artwork so if i understand it right there's three finalists selected to develop their ideas further i, I guess maybe that's the first question yeah, our, 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 our goal is to identify three potential artists or organizations. That's one of the other, one of the other tweaks to the, 
to the call was um, opening it up to potentially to organizations that may want to um, submit proposals as well. But yeah, we, what we would do is present a slate of three artists and based on recommendations and portfolio work from those three artists, uh, we would select a finalist. And the, there's a panel that would be doing that selection that would include two members of the community? Correct. Okay, and how are those community members selected? What we have done in the past is the Arts Commission has asked individual members of the community to join. Um, I will tell you that this is the first time that we are um, using the public art policy to this extent. And so we, that we're charting new territory here and we have to, um, we're still in the process of identifying and, and asking folks if they are interested in participating. Okay. Um, Just, uh, I would note as we're going through this that the members of the Arts Commission are also members of the community as well as the member of the Parks and Rec Commission. Just. Correct. It would, it, 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 we'd be looking at a nine member panel for vetting Total. applications for this. I, I ask because I believe that there are some folks who have expressed interest in this project that uh, I'm sure will want to know how they can be on that panel. And, and so we need to be clear um, or that, I mean, I'm fine with the Arts Commission, you know, handling that, but um, I would hope that, you know, it, it be a transparent process. Um, My understanding of that was also that um, it would be someone that has an art background or is somehow tied in to the art community. So um, we're, we already have someone like from the Parks and Rec Commission thinking from that angle and the additional person from the community uh, wouldn't necessarily be a lay person, but another person with expertise in art. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And, and Nancy, the other, the other thing that we spoke about was the potential of maybe including a downtown business owner, um, you know, just making sure that we've got a, a variety of voices on that panel. Okay. Okay. Uh, it just wasn't laid out. And so I, it, was a hole for me. Um, well, and, and, and that is, that's a, a, a copy and paste out of the art policy. So this is the same procedure that we use when we procure a piece of art from the county art show in August. Okay. So it's consistent with existing policy and procedure. It is. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Other questions? comments. I, I do have one other question, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the par uh, if, if a project comes in and it's for a permanent uh, installation, have you had any discussion with Parks and Rec uh, Director about the planning of the park that's going on and how you would work with him to fit that in to whatever that plan might be. So Nancy, I can speak to that. Um, when the Arts Commission had their special meeting on this topic, um, I asked the Parks Director Brad Case to join in just in case questions came up specifically about that or the timeline or what structures have been identified as staying and leaving and so that was part of the discussion. Right. Thank you. Good to hear. Yeah, yes. I think the other thing to note is that I, if I read the call for artists or the, whatever we're called, whatever that's called, um, it indicated that an artist could <clears throat> could propose a permanent installation, but recognize that it may need to be moved. That the, the the installation in the location may not be permanent, though the artwork itself may be. Okay. That sounds good. Other questions from council? 
I just wanted to say thank you to Jerry and the rest of the Arts Commission for taking taking an idea and a concept and making it um, making it a, a, a workable project. They already had policy, good policy in place, and a community engaging process. And I just I think it's a really good a really good fit. Uh, for a really good group of, like you said, community members who invest a lot of their personal time to make sure that the Ellensburg Arts community flourishes. Yes, thank you. Um, we've got one hand raised from the public. Oh, hi, yeah, this is, this is Stacey Hammond again, 308 North Samson. I, I always say I'll speak for myself, but I probably speak for other people in the community. Um, I was wondering if the council could address quickly whether or not you're only receiving visual artwork or are you only receiving people that can put up something visually? You know, not everybody can see, for instance, we might have blind community members. Are you willing to allow people to introduce their art that would be maybe, I don't know, speaking, orating in your downtown? Or are you only allowing visual or art, sculpted art? Because, um, you know, you said you were going to hire art experts and the park was going to have or you're not know, point, excuse me, art experts. Uh, what does that exactly mean to you guys? Um, you know, maybe other people see art differently. So are you willing to have a listening art, mute people playing music or people speaking to the public? Thank you. Thank you. Again, I would just refer you to the call for artists and the outline that's in the uh, packet. Um, Teresa, it's got a hand up, Teresa Plug. Mute. Hello, Teresa Plu. 140 Woodhouse Loop. A um, couple of questions. Let's see. The gentleman who reported, I didn't catch his first name. Was it Jerry? Yep. Um, he mentioned a document where, where they learned about racial equity and they used terms to define that. And at the first Arts Commission meeting, um, I had asked for a clear definition of racial equity so I could share it with people who might want to put in a proposal so they'd know what the rules are. I didn't, he, he said what the document was, where they got that from, but it occurred so fast that I wasn't able to write it down. Is that actually someplace, that document, where he got his terminology from, is that posted someplace on um, the Arts Commission um, site or on City Council site? Yep. Jerry, yeah, if I may, uh, Jerry, if you may, just if you could restate um, the the document that you referenced. Well, can, I, can I interrupt? Oh. What's what's in the call for artists is what governs, not any supplemental or background document. Okay, but it but it refers to racial equity. It it, it does, and I think that that Jerry was just saying they defined that in the call to artists. I didn't I didn't see it, that clearly in there. I read it before the meeting, but if he thinks it's clear. Uh, it, okay, Jerry, if you want to address it, but, yeah. but the, uh, well, the, the, again, the language in the call for artists is what is governing. Is, right, and the language also that refer, I mean, so let's just, <clears throat> you mentioned an organization. I don't need, to, we do not need to define just Right. I think the request is right. I just want the document so I can go look at it and educate myself. Is all. Yeah, and and that document is the is the racial equity toolkit. It was generated by the local and regional government alliance on race and equity. Regional and what? Uh, local and regional government alliance on race and equity. On race and equity. Yep, and I, I can help you out even more. Their website is racialequityalliance.org. Racial equity. Okay, great. And Thank then, you. and then there was a person on the October sixteenth Arts Commission meeting. Um, I don't remember her name. She had blonde hair, and. She said that it was all about Black Lives Matter and that this was their moment. Um, State or Tristan, you were at that meeting for sure. I think Stacy was too. And after that, I called um, Planning Director Sackett, Tristan, and I asked her if she had been at the meeting, and she said yes. And I asked her what she thought of that and perceived of it, and. 
she said that she she said that that was just one arts commission person weighing in that she didn't think that the whole art project was going to focus on that is that what the outcome was because i wasn't able to attend the september 2nd meeting and i couldn't find it online to rewatch it okay so again i would just refer you to the call for artists okay the, fo the focus of the of the of the installation that we're discussing is is in the call for artists in the call for artists part okay i'll That's go back and look at that thank you okay thank you um <clears throat> okay so then do we need a motion i Teresa, do you have another question or, or comment? I just saw your hand pop up. I think I lowered it. Okay, let me hit that button again. Okay, that's fine. We can just move on then. Let's, um, is, so what, what is, um, it's called out in the agenda as a motion. Yeah. So, so let's, I can move we, have, we approve a call for art for a temporary art installation at the Rotary Pavilion area as included in the agenda packet. And I second. So a motion and second to uh, approve a call for art notice as out, as presented in the agenda packet for a temporary art installation at the Rotary Pavilion arena area, sorry. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 I too vote aye, that motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Thanks to the Arts Commission really for the work that went into uh, getting this in front of us and thinking it through. I really appreciate it. And thanks to the subcommittee for, for sticking with it. Um, so let's move down to 11A now. We're on page 91. Uh, <clears throat> these are council funded grant programs to 2021 grant awards. Good evening, Mayor and Council. This is Lori Gigstead of the City Manager's Office. The council funded grant program was established in 2015 by resolution the council set funding limits for each program as follows community grants park partnership grants and historic preservation grants were each allocated 0.3 percent of the previous year's annual sales tax revenue which for 2021 is fifteen thousand three hundred and ten dollars and twenty seven cents per program the water quality grant program was set at ten thousand uh, dollars per year for the annual from annual stormwater revenue so the total funding for 2021 is set at fifty five thousand nine hundred and thirty dollars and eighty one cents uh, the council subcommittee the parks and recreation commission landmarks and design commission and environmental commission have reviewed the application and project requests submitted for funding and determined that the requests met the eligibility requirements and were consistent with the intent of each program. The four program recommend recommendations are attached to the agenda report. Staff is requesting that council consider the award recommendations and authorize the funding distributions as presented in the amount of $55,930.27. Thank you. Uh, Council. Um, Mr. Mayor, I, I, in reading the, uh, I, I think it's Scrivener's error, possibly, I'm not sure if I'm doing the math correctly, but the, the addition of the, the three grants, uh, the 15,310 times three plus 10,000. I think there's a difference there of, you know, about 65 cents. It's not a big deal, but it adds up to be 55, 930 and 81 cents instead of 27 cents. You know, at this late hour, that's a, a very minor point, but. The parks department and the council subcommittee chose not to allocate the 27 cents. Oh, we got that gifted back. Okay, perfect. Thank, <laughs> right. thank you. That's, that's good, thanks. Good job, Lori. Okay. I'll take okay. it. Gives up money, right? So, so council. Um, I'll, I'll move that uh, the council award the uh, recommended grants uh, and authorize the funding distribution in the amount of $55,930.27. Second. 
Is there a motion second to uh, <clears throat> to affirm the award recommendations as outlined in our council packet for grant funding distributions in the amount of $55,930.27. Further discussion? I just wanna thank all of the uh, commission members who uh, evaluated and weighed in on, on the grant proposals and for the community members who stepped up and um, uh, provided uh, grant applications. Right. Any other comment? Um, I would just also to note, um, the Landmarks and Design funds uh, is funding uh, a private sector application for uh, facade improvements and to recognize that while we lump these under the uh, funded grants or community grants or uh, that uh, both nonprofits and, and private sector can be eligible for these grants. Um, so I think that, um, and to recognize that. So um, is there any further discussion on the motion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 I too vote aye. That motion carries. Thank you. That then brings us to page 99. This is a third quarter financial status and investment report. Good evening again, um, Council and Mr. Mayor, Jerrica Pasco, Finance Director. I am going to try to share my screen here. Well, you're not sharing your camera. Uh, well, I could do that if you'd like, <laughs> but... <laughs> I prefer not to, but it's. I, I had a feeling when the fourth time, <laughs> the fourth time that you come in front of us in one night and you have it, I you, figured, yeah. You can okay. see the mess back behind me in the office here if I do that. So. <laughs> okay, your screen is working now. We're share that's shared. Okay. Um, okay, so beginning on page 103 of your agenda report is the 2023rd quarter financial status and investment reports for the period. Um, ending September 30th of 2020. The 2020 third quarter financial status and investment report was presented to the finance committee at the October 15, 2020 meeting. This report attempts to update the fiscal impact projections created by the current pandemic situation. Year end projections were made as of the current situation on 9-30-2020. Projections were made with the COVID-19 in mind and were predicated on remaining in phase three through year end. So again, since economic situations continue to change so rapidly and in such unprecedented ways, the projections in this quarterly report may already be outdated by the time this is presented to council tonight. Um, on the first table there, page one, you'll see that general fund expenditures are expected to come in below budget as required. Staff does continue to evaluate all the purchases for need and is only approving expenditures that are essential for conducting city business at this time. The budgeted expenditures reflect all the adjustments that have been taken to council for approval prior to the October 5th. Revenue projections were done on an individual basis and will be discussed um, further in this report. Um, as always, actuals are there in blue. Um, your year end projections are in red and the budgeted amount is in green. Table two shows our governmental funds tax revenue. So overall the governmental tax um, or government, all governmental fund tax revenue is projected to fall short by approximately $293,596 or about 1.85%. Sales tax and um, hotel motel tax are expected to be the hardest hit governmental fund tax revenue again. The hotel motel tax being the highest in this revenue was currently projected at 59% of 2019. The other column, I guess I should state here, um, uh, the third row down the other column is the column that include, or the row that includes your hotel motel tax. Um, sales tax revenue is projected to fall short of the 2020 budget by only $33,749 here. This is a big change from our second quarter projections, which had over a million dollar shortfall. However, recent state orders um, will now have an effect on these again and possibly affect us meeting these third quarter projections. 
Um, table three breaks down the difference of budgeted less projected by tax purpose. Sales tax revenue received in September again is for July activity. So because of the lag in reporting and receiving of sales tax from the state, we're still unable to see how the transition of phases has affected our numbers locally. So we still don't know what the canceling of fair rodeo, for example, as well as the decrease in the number of CWU students returning um, did to our September numbers because we won't see those numbers until the end of November. We used an average of sales tax over the past nine months compared to the first nine months in 2019 in order to project um, through year end. So projections were set at about 95% of 2019 actuals. And other little savings here in the budget where it says whether we're over or under budget is, is under your the last row, which was the retail sales housing tax credit that wasn't budgeted. So it looks like we're 73,000 over um, projections for final budget. So that helps a little bit in that number there. Table four shows a year to date sales tax activity for January through September of 2019 compared to January through September of 2020. And when I refer to these since we're cash basis, these revenues are for November through July sales. Um, in retail trade, the 7% increase that you see there in retail trade doesn't necessarily tell the story of the local retailers because, again, this includes a lot of online purchases. So overall, there we see a decrease of 4%, which is a little bit better than last quarter. It was 6.68% that we saw. Um, the largest dollar decrease, again, remains as in the accommodation and food services um, line, which is down 95,000 from the previous year or 19%. Or that is holding pretty steady from second quarter. Second quarter, it was down 18.28%. So um, it stayed pretty steady through, through third quarter. Table five shows our utility tax activity for January through September of 19 compared to January through September of 2020. Um, overall, there isn't hardly any change. It's um, less than a half a percent. However, the individual um, taxes are seeing ups and downs. The, the biggest decrease right there is in the gas utility tax, and that is because in 2019, we had higher gas prices, and those prices are reflected in the rates that we charge to the customers and in the revenue that we receive there. So um, that's expected to be down and telephone and cable are also expected to continue to go down as we see less and less landlines and less and less um, cable lines. Uh, table six, I wanted to remind you again, does not include sales tax in this general fund calculation. So this is general fund revenues and expenditures, the budgeted versus actual. So Overall general fund, not including the sales tax reserve fund, which is what we're currently spending our fund balance for general fund in, um, was projected to increase the fund balance at the end of the year by $166,288 um, in that second, second column that you see there. Up in the fourth column when we're looking at budgeted less projected um, for the revenues, the revenues are expected in the general, general fund to have a shortfall of around $381,000. And below there, we're expecting to underspend um, in our expenditures in the general fund by about $1.25 million, which allows for our carry forward of 166,000. But again, this does not include sales tax, which we track in a separate managerial fund um, throughout the year, which is what we're, where we're seeing our shortfall. Here on page um, 109, table seven, I highlighted part of the debt activities. And the reason why I did this was just to show we typically make our interest only debt payments in June. And then in November for December 1st is when we pay our principal and the second half of our interest due. So I highlighted those debt payments that are gonna be coming due at the end of this month, because those will make um, a significant cash balance effect in some of those funds when we make those debt payments, um, including the general fund where we, we make our inner fund loan um, city hall construction um, fund payment. The 
Table on the next page, our revenues and expenditures shows that the city brought in 7.49 million more than it spent third quarter of 2020. However, 7.46 million of that excess of revenue over expenses from the utility and internal service funds. Um, and the rates for these are um, include replacement and capital funding plans. If we look at the general fund right now, it looks like it's up 970 million or 970,000, sorry. Um, however, that's down a half a million from second quarter's balance, and it does not include yet our transfers to the fire relief and pension fund um, for support or the debt payment for the city hall bond loan. In the end, we combine that too with our sales tax reserve fund that's part of the way down, and you can see that we're down um, just over a million, 1.1 million in the sales tax reserve fund. Um, also down right before a little bit farther at the CARES Act reimbursement fund. That's additional money that we have spent on um, COVID expenses that haven't been reimbursed um, yet by the state. Um, I'm going to have to pull up one more here for you. And here we have our investment report. The city had $55,811,021 in excess cash invested at the end of third quarter. Um, $40,303,448 of that was in the LGIP, which is the local government investment pool. The LGIP interest earning rate at the end of September was very low and continuing to go lower, of course, and it was at 0.215%. We had um, 15.5 million in other investments and just over 680,000 remaining in our inner fund loans that are earning an interest of 1%. Staff recommends council accept the third quarter financial status and investment reports as presented. Thank you. Any questions? Council. Okay, so I'll entertain a motion that we accept the third quarter financial reports as presented. I'll so move. Um, do, do we get That's a second it. there? Well, I heard a second. So we have a motion and second to accept the third quarter financial reports as presented. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Aye, two vote aye, that motion carries. Thank you. Just um, thank you, Jerrica, yeah. for the thorough report. Thank you. Good stuff. Um, let's move then to 12A. This is the manager's report. We're on page 115. Mr. Mayor, Council, um, just to, just wanted to remind everyone of our meeting uh, with the CWU cabinet uh, on November 18th, three o'clock. Um, the preliminary agenda has been distribute it out to the council. And if you have any questions or see anything that you'd like to have added or deleted, uh, let me know. And we can, we're trying to wrap that agenda up as quickly as possible. The meeting link is uh, shown in your agenda packet. You'll also receive a link um, that will get you into that meeting. Um, the At the time of the writing of the manager's report, we had some uh, idea of the various facilities that we might continue to operate and that changed drastically uh, last night. Um, the Ellensburg Racket Recreation Center, uh, we're going to give you the holiday hours, but essentially under the governor's order, that facility is now closed. The, uh, the pool and fitness center, the pool side uh, will remain open. Uh, the fitness center will be closed in the closure hours for the, uh, the pool side for holidays is, is going to be from November, it'd be uh, November 26th for Thanksgiving and then from December 24th to January 4th. And the reason for the length of that closure is, uh, is to do the, the pool maintenance that we ordinarily do during rodeo and fair 
uh, essentially the, the pool was closed down during that period of time. Since that did not occur, we did not close. Uh, and so the, the, the closure will give us the ability to, to drain the pool and paint. And so that's, that's going to take place. And then the youth center uh, will be closed for Thanksgiving on the 26th, and then also closed uh, for the period between December 21st and January 3rd. So uh, that's all I have for you this evening. I'd be glad to entertain questions. Great, thanks. Council. Okay, then let's go to council reports. Let's, uh, you want to, Nancy Lowquist, you want to start? Uh, sure. I attended an airport strategic planning um, meeting and reviewed the initial draft um, assessment and I uh, just wanted to report a couple of fun facts from that assessment. Um, the, the airport, they uh, estimate um, generates around $40 million in total economic impact for the for the economy of um, our area and Kittitas County has 11.7 licensed pilots per 100,000 population and that's in comparison to Washington State 4.5 uh, pilots per 100,000 and way higher than any of our surrounding counties um, including Grant County and they have a airport there too and Anyway, so uh, for some reason, there's a lot of pilots living in Kittitas County. Um, also attended a um, Zoom meeting uh, on glass recycling. Uh, the Morning Rotary Club and uh, some other clubs are uh, fundraising to purchase uh, a crusher, glass crusher uh, to make sand out of our waste glass and they're looking uh, for opportunities for um, uh, using that glass in local products. So trying to make some sort of industrial or other use out of um, waste, our waste product rather than hauling it away uh, to landfills. So um, they have CWU involved as well as uh, the Department of Ecology and Department of Commerce and um, have reached out to businesses making countertops and um, cement blocks and all kinds of things. So, um, so there, there's a number of really bright people uh, on that and um, if uh, that's something you wanted to get involved in, I, I'm sure they uh, would um, welcome more voices there. That's all I have. Great, thanks. Stacy. I attended my usual meetings at uh, Parks and Rec and the EBDA and the Planning Commission and have nothing else to report. Thanks. Let's do uh, Tristan. We had Arts Commission and Ellensburg, or, uh, the Library Board. Um, the Friends of the Library had a successful fundraiser, even though it was a non-traditional event. Um, so that was that was good, and the virtual story times continue to be popular. Um, also, uh, Stacy and I ha finally, after many months, had uh, tours of city facilities, including. Um, the wastewater treatment facility, which was a uh, field trip that I missed in elementary school. So it was um, <laughs> really educational. And um, we have a lot of really good city staff was my main takeaway. Thanks. Uh, Nancy Gillette. Uh, yes, I am. Um, there's some discussion at on the CW campus uh, and they're moving toward revising or revitalizing uh, Not In Our Kit Co. Uh, group that we put together. Nancy Lilquist was a part of that in 2016 or something like that, 15. Anyway, uh, they're having some meetings to discuss uh, how they wanna move forward with that. They are reevaluating the mission of that group from the 
uh, original uh, purpose that it had, trying to decide whether or not they want this to be more of a, a service kind of organization or if they want to have a, a, a political uh, agenda. Uh, so they're having conversations and we'll see how that turns out. The Association of Central Washington University Students is uh, the group that's leading up that effort. And the only other thing I have to report is we're putting the finishing touches on our final report for the IDE from the IDE subcommittee. And we're looking forward to presenting that at the December 7th council meeting. <clears throat> David. See, uh, I attended the uh, council grant commit subcommittee with Mayor Tav and then, um, oh, I did that too. Council member uh, Goodlow, who also attended. She, I think about <laughs> yeah, a virtual that. meeting for me at least. Um, so you've already seen the, the results of that work. Uh, I also attended the Washington Community all virtual as the Washington Community Forestry Council meeting um, a couple weeks ago, and then. I participated in the last, what I think is the last of the uh, equity subgroup for the Association of Washington Cities. It's been meeting since summer uh, to develop some recommendations for the board. And we have, uh, along with AWC staff, have uh, identified prioritization or sort of priorities within both the first year and then the next two to three years. Um, and I, I think the main theme, the main takeaways are that um, the recommendations ask the board to focus on uh, incorporating um, the themes, the real action plan, the race, equity, and leadership elements uh, into all aspects of AWC, whether it's um, hiring of AWC staff, recruiting um, AWC members among the 281 cities that are represented. Um, not just being a member because we're all technically members once you're elected, but participating in events. Also recognizing that it's difficult for, for some um, council members or even city staff folks around the state to participate at conferences um, for a variety of reasons. So I think that the goal is to try to broaden the, um, the accessibility uh, across the board. Um, and then I think we'll see a lot more training opportunities on this theme coming through AWC um, over the next few years. So um, there's periodic opportunities to participate in an AWC training seminar. We'll probably start to include more on this subject. So uh, and it's a really interesting group of about mm, probably 12, 13 council members, mayors from around the state all different cities from Okanagan County to uh, Clark County and West Side, East Side. Um, I think it was an interesting and worthwhile group to participate in. So anyway, I'll keep you posted if I learn any more. Great, thanks. And we really appreciate your willingness to, to work on that. It was, a, it was a great conduit for us in terms of, of where we're going and uh, the connections you're making with other uh, <laughs> municipalities and people. Yeah, I was gonna, uh, the recommendations are being formulated. Uh, they'll go to the board for their, in their December board meeting, um, but I expect there'll be some public rollout once the AWC kind of gets it. Uh, so we'll be looking to share that when it, when it becomes available. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Um, so I did just a couple things. I had on Veterans Day, I had the opportunity to go out to the uh, Thorpe fruit stand and trees. Uh, Minute Mart or whatever it is out there uh, for the unfurling of the flag. I actually got to be part of the group that was feeding the flag onto the flagpole because the thing's so big that you can't just like run it up. You've got to string it out, then pull it. Uh, so it was well attended, uh, good energy. Uh, it's really quite remarkable if you take a drive out that way. Uh, you really can't miss it if you're, at least if you live in Thorpe now, you've got a true landmark to tell people to get off and go find you. Um, <clears throat> also been doing some ongoing meetings with the county and DH, the folks that are doing the communications work with, uh, with the county for the health department as well as uh, the stay, um, 
spread kindness, not COVID campaign that's ramping up. We should see more of that going out this week. Um, I had an opportunity to meet with uh, the city attorney and human resources, um, Cindy, uh, to initiate the process for the city manager search. Um, we'll have, um, I, and I, um, I don't have a lot to share at this point other than we have that initial conversation where um, Cindy is researching um, uh, search firms the costs of those. Um, and I believe that we'll have that conversation at our next council meeting, just in terms of providing direction for how we wanna proceed with the search, but um, that is moving forward. Um, <clears throat> the last, and I'll also attain weekly, um, uh, we have the county uh, recovery committee uh, that continues to meet. Uh, the, um, the other piece I just wanted to get in front of folks, and I, I really am thinking if, if we can get a consensus of council, uh, it would be good. Um, the concern that's been expressed really, I think is that um, <clears throat> with the governor's announcement of the statewide res um, restrictions, um, it feels as if um, one, again, our businesses are being uh, hurt. Um, and um, I think it would be I think it would be helpful for us to be on record uh, as a county, as both a city and and, and county, um, to um, indicate that um, we have done some really incredible things in Kittitas County. Uh, I know Dr. Larson indicated that the rate is gone up, um, so that he wouldn't have to be a liar, um, but. Um, the, the, the fact of the matter is really when you look at, at the collaborations that have occurred between the health department and central between the school districts, uh, the work that the school districts have done to get folk to get kids back into the into into the classroom. Um, and generally, I think the, the community response, I'm concerned that um, the restrictions will generate a negative community response in a certain way as we were really building community support. Um, I think there's ways that that can be addressed. And actually, Tristan and I were on a conversation with uh, the DH folks, the folks that are doing the com uh, communications piece this afternoon. Um, and I think there's some really positive steps that will be taken uh, to continue to build our sense of community and, and, and mutual support. Um, but I'm also thinking that it would not be the worst thing for us to make the governor's office aware of the of the positive, the communicate, the collaborations and partnerships that have been developed, the work that we've done locally to be able to make this work representative of our individual communities, um, and also to to, to basically um, possibly ask for an exemption, uh, but I, from the restrictions, so that we can continue to maintain and support our local direction. I would suggest that it would be appropriate for COG um, to have that discussion and then and then hopefully have all the all the municipalities as well as the counties sign on uh, to a to a countywide letter uh, pointing out those areas of co both collaboration and success and the, really the feeling of local success that we've had and and really requesting that we continue to have that ability to direct uh, and support our local communities um, as we're moving through the pandemic. Um, and so I, I, again, I don't have anything to put in front of you other than to ask that if COG is, is willing to move forward with a countywide response, if you're willing to um, support uh, my signature on a letter that would go to the governor's office expressing more or less the sentiments that I just uh, expressed. And Mark's back on the phone, on the line, um, on the call here, and um, and if you do have questions, certainly I can uh, attempt to answer them. If I can't answer them, I can always make something up and say it with some degree of certitude. So, you recommend you're you are recommending that the county collaborate together with all the cities and ask for an exemption from the current 
restrictions that the governor just issued. Is that, am I understanding that correctly? Yeah, I mean, I think the emphasis is on our success and the, and the building of local coalition and collaboration. Um, but the ultimate ask, and I don't know where COG's gonna be with it, um, but I, you know, the preference would be to have all the municipalities sign on so that really it's a common voice that's moving forward uh, to the governor's office. I, I think that I would hesitate to sign on to a letter, so authorize you to sign on to a letter that I haven't seen. Yeah, so the challenge is, I, I get it. Um, the challenge is, is that I feel as if we need to move. It would be helpful, I think, for the governor to understand what we've accomplished sooner rather than later um and i'm i'm 100 on board with telling the governor our successes i'm not sure about asking for an exemption just because i don't know how that is how how that's framed and i don't know um i don't i don't know what justifies it in terms of the numbers. Well, the, yeah, so the numbers are wonky to begin with. I mean, the thing to recognize is that as a, as a county, and Mark or Dr. Larson, shoot me if I'm incorrect, we barely met metrics um, to get into phase three if we met them. Um, and not for very long. And the, Right, and the district, marginally met metrics to, to reopen um, at the point at which they, they, they did their phased in approach. So, and, and there, there also has been ongoing feedback that in conversations with the governor's office and with the health department, that the metrics are changing. <laughs> that, that the 75 that was sort of the, the gold standard um, may not be the measure that we use to determine success. And I, I mean, I don't, I don't know whether I can go into the weeds. I, I, I don't, you know, I mean, I. Clearly we've learned a lot about the disease since March. And so refining the numbers and the metrics seems appropriate, but yeah, I, yeah. If Dr. Larson has Thoughts, I'd love to hear them or, or Tristan. You're muted. You're muted, Doc. Thank you. There we go. How about there? That's yeah. good. I'm on the I'm on the phone and on the computer. As I, I've been on listening to you all, I've just been counting counting cases as to where they Please. came from. So, um, you know, that I would agree with Mayor Tab in regards to, to we've done things differently than, than some of the other counties have, um, and we've done them better. Um, it's difficult for me to weigh in on whether or not we should you know, well, it's um, the the restrictions placed by the governor seem to be capricious uh, in some ways, um, and but I can tell you that they were supported uh, by some of the health officers and directors, and some of the health op officers and directors wanted uh, a little more control of the process. Um, the reason the governor came out and um, and indicated it from a statewide standpoint because it took a lot of pressure off of the local health departments and health officers uh, where we wouldn't have to be arguing with our elected officials all the time over what we were doing. Um, I think I, I certainly would support reaching out and saying, here's what we've done in Kittitas County. Um, 
and and how we've managed the disease here so far, uh, I think it'll have more of an effect as we get past these first four weeks than it would be a, a direct effect on what's happening currently. Uh, because there, because once once these restrictions are, once we get to the four weeks, then they're going to be looking at each county and seeing essentially how we're doing uh, to make decisions going forward. So I think I think there would be some benefit to uh, writing a letter of support to to the work that the that the county has done to controlling disease here, because I think that that's pretty obvious if you look at what's happened here versus what's happened in Yakima or Grant County or Chelan Douglas and certainly and certainly King County. Um, I would just, um, without some um, legal teeth behind what we're doing, and I know you're not talking about a lawsuit here, uh, but um, I think I think it would help. I think it, pointing out what we've done in the county as far as working together as a community and how we continue to do that with uh, the spread kindness, not COVID, and work with Central. I think that's I think that's helpful. I know the state has heard that before, but I'm not sure how much the governor has heard that. Yeah, Nancy, I'll add. Go ahead. I'm sorry, Tristan. No, just. Um, you know, Mayor Tab was referring to you know, when we applied for phase two, um, at, at days after we applied for phase two, there was a local outbreak and we were no longer eligible, but it was um, the, the work of our community members, community partners to ensure that that was contained to the extent that it could be allowed us to move into phase two even the, even when we no longer met the, the eligibility for that. So I do think um, I do think it's helpful to show support of local health by the elected. I think it's um, I think it helps to show that you know there's it's one thing to for the county and municipalities to ask for an exception. It, it would be a different thing, right? Something that public health can support if if instead the response was just to say, well, let's just be open anyway. When right, when what we're really trying to prove is that we can be, we can keep our community safe. Um, so I, those are my two cents from from a public health side. We have, um, it's really showing evidence that that we have maybe the resources, the tools, the partnerships that other communities don't have, um, and that's been our strength from from day one. Um, so. So I guess I'm just reassuring my council from from a public health side. This is not, you know, your approach. You know, so as long as as long as it's still coming from that perspective of we believe we can do these things, keeping our community safe. That was a similar approach that public health and our partners took when we did a phase two application. So I think that's really, you know, what I would be looking for in any in any message. And I think that's, that's, at least in my mind, the drafts that I put together, that's the framework, Nancy. I, I mean, I don't know if that addresses it specifically, um, but it's really attempting to demonstrate and celebrate what, what we have accomplished. <clears throat> you know, and, it, and the final language may not be an exemption. It may just simply be consideration for local flexibility or you know, some other kinds of semantic twists. Um, that that would get us to the same place without having to grant some noblesse oblige exemption <laughs> for us to to do it. Um, that that might be, but um, you, Chris, I was wondering you, uh, yeah. in the conversation, uh, is there sort of the intent to target specific restrictions and say, you know, we've got a better way kind of point by point or just sort of no or to a more flexible arrangement yeah i think it's really looking for more for a flexible arrangement I, you know I, I mean i think the 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 from my perspective it's probably how are we going to support and manage kind of the restaurant piece of it if i look at it 
you know, that's not the focus at all of the, of the letter that I framed initially. Um, you know, but if I look at job loss and if I look at uh, my observation in, in um, how restaurants have managed with the support of Dr. Larson and the health department, um, I feel as if we're being painted by, truthfully, being painted with an urban brush which ignores the work that we have done and that our individual businesses have done to keep people safe and keep their doors open. So that's really, no, so it's, but, but the framing would not be specific because I think it would get us into the weeds too quickly, uh, you know, to specific industries. I, I think the I think the messaging to the community is really critical too. If we do this, uh, that it doesn't mean that we think we should ignore the governor's recommendation on groups and the number in groups and staying home and wearing a face mask. And it doesn't mean that we don't have an issue here in Kitty Pass County with COVID. Uh, and some people would take it that way, uh, perhaps. And <clears throat> I guess I'm a little concerned about how that piece would be messaged to the community. Yeah, I was just going to say that I I agree, and I think there is some concern that we, I mean, it, how the message would be interpreted. I think in general, I'm supportive of um, recognizing that individual locations, counties, communities are, are handling this differently. And I think some recognition of that is fine. Um, I think overall, if, if our county health department it will ultimately support any proposed change, I think I, I can live with that too. Um, but Well, let me ask this, John, I mean, John's on and says, Terry, um, you know, to, to Nancy's point is, because I envision a certain a certain similar conversation occurring at COD, I mean, which is sort of why I don't have anything concrete to put in front of council because I wouldn't I wouldn't know how to frame something in front of council that then COD would either muck with that we would not be comfortable with. Is th is there a path that would support the city moving forward with a, a COG agreed upon COG letter that that would allow council to review that in some way or would we need to wait till the next meeting i think you do would need to either wait for the next meeting or schedule a, a special meeting to have that discussion okay. we also was going to ask um, in addition to cog or part of cog do we know if the or a county commissioners has drafted a letter of this sort as a template? Um, yeah, they, I believe they have. So is that available to review and is that going to give us? Um, let's say actually this is Monday. So they're they're reviewing their letter, I think tomorrow morning. Okay. It's on their agenda. Well, that would give us an opportunity to see how closely we are aligned with the county's position. It may be the same or it may not, but I think COG may. Well, I think that letter would go to in front of COG. Right. We have, a, we have a COG meeting on Wednesday evening. So, so I mean, there's an opportunity. I, I mean, if we were, let me, let me ask you this, because I, from my perspective, I think it's important as a county to get in front of the governor. Um, we've asked the governor numerous times for local flexibility in funding our, in, in, in spending our lodging tax money. We've asked the governor a number of times for local flexibility in spending rural sales tax money, all of which would be supporting our local businesses right now if we, if we had those resources. Um, we're really tapped out in terms of resources. Um, it does not appear that there's CARES Act money left. Um, I'm, I'm pushing the chamber to provide information about where they are with their uh, funds from their ADO and CARES Act money and trying to get a reconciliation out of the county also. But I'm just not clear that there's any resources left other than can we build local flexibility to be able to support our businesses to operate in a way that's safe? That's, so that's part of the challenge. Let me ask this council then, if, if COG meets uh, and there is a general agreement with COG, 
to draft a letter um, would, uh, I mean, to Terry's point, it would not be that challenging, particularly with Zoom, to schedule a special meeting with that on as the agenda. Would would uh, I don't envision it would be an hour, two hour meeting. I mean. <laughs> You know, we, and we would then have the ability to get the draft letter in front of council prior to the meeting um, as a way for review and then input and then see where we stand. Um, are, are, would council be willing to to entertain that? Because yes. I, yeah, yeah, I think that's fair. I, would. Would, I mean, it seems like that might be the most reasonable approach. That that way, to David's point, we would have the opportunity to review whatever the commissioners are saying, because we may not want to align. Uh, we may not want to align with the commissioners. Um, you know, so, in, in, yeah. I, I, I have, so if, I mean, I think I can support a letter that tells our successes and, and the collaboration and stuff and asks for flexibility, but I don't think I can support asking for an exemption at yeah. this point, it, but I, that if there was nuanced language that, that, that asked for that flexibility, I, I can support that. Yeah. yeah. Is it? I, yeah, that it would not be difficult to, to, to it would not be difficult to, to craft that, that, that language. That was still less opposed to, to the public health goal, right, of, of doing anything that's possible to reduce transmission. So we, well, I mean, there might be some things yeah. locally that we would do different and did do different before the statewide thing, but that would be, um, but that it'd be easier to support. And I, I also feel like we need that to pay attention to the messaging. The, the implied messaging can be, the messaging that want, we want to go up can provide a different message that, than what's going out in the community. And, and I think we need to be, that, I mean, I think that's a good point, that, that we need to be sensitive to that. Stacy, you were weighing in or trying to weigh yeah, in. Yeah, I had a couple things. One, um, it sounds like you feel a single letter with all the cities on it is more effective than each of the cities writing a letter and distributing them together. I, I think the value of, of the single letter is we, we're agreeing upon the language, you know, to the, to the point that we're just even even discussing here, you know, semantically, you know, if not say, but say South South Clayton goes off here, and that's included as part of the packet. Yeah. Okay. Are we, you know, are we comfortable as a council with that? I'm not sure we would be. Okay. So then, um, my other thoughts are just that um, uh, the, I don't know if there's enough data. I guess. I, my decision would be based on the data, if the data even exists, but um, the governor's orders really shut down businesses, which is a major problem for us, especially without having the local flexibility and funding, like you mentioned. Um, but I don't know that uh, based on Dr. Larson's previous presentations to us, you know, I've heard a lot of it's the home gatherings, and I don't know that Governor Inslee's orders are going to be really effective in changing that behavior in our community. So I wonder if whether or not the businesses are closed, is that really going to change our case rate after Thanksgiving? And so um, if we can somehow message the community that we're asking the governor's office for some flexibility if we can keep the case rate down over the next 14 days. And um, we were really successful in the summer in coming together in the spring as, as a community. And uh, I would just have concerns that whether or not the restaurants are open, is that really gonna change anything as everybody gathers in their homes in the next 10 days? Probably not. So, yeah, if there's if there's a way to, I mean, I I see that being the huge influx, and then if our case rate skyrockets, yeah. do we really yes. want an exemption to have everybody then going to the restaurants? I mean, I feel like that makes it more difficult for a public public health department to be effective in controlling the pandemic. So I would probably well, either tie the well, two together and ask for flexibility if we can keep our numbers below a certain rate for the next few days, or wait. 14 days and then ask for an exemption and show that we've had success. Yeah, we, 
I would indicate that I'm not clear what success is at this point. Um, I think the other piece for me, if I look at the dynamic, um, right, wrong, or indifferent, um, I don't know how many central students are being tested and going home, but there's a huge portion of our, of our community that will be going somewhere over the next 30 days. Well, actually 45 days, because they're not slated to come back till after the first of the year. Um, yeah, and so I don't know how that then affects. I mean, you know, Dr. Larson was indicating that uh, mo most of the positives right now are occurring within our uh, community members, not within the student population. Um, so I, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I mean, I think the other concern, my other underlying concern I've got to say is I think 30 days, to, the 30 days will be expen extended. Yeah. Yeah. I mean that. So that's I agree my... with that entirely, and I, that's where I would support a, a merit-based option. But I, I don't want to have. I don't want to ask for an exemption for thirty days. I mean, we've all kind of acknowledged this changes so quickly. Yeah. Uh, but I think a merit-based system like we had before is really effective, and our county has showed that we can achieve those metrics. Versus what you mentioned, Mayor Tab, and kind of painting everybody with a broad brush based on, you know, urban centers. Well, it may be that if the semantics that we use in terms of um, local control is where we could we could flex that. I mean, that the, we're we as a council or we as COG, <clears throat> those those conversations historically have been what have occurred between Dr. Larson and Tristan and and the governor's office, right? Not us. Um, you know, they're aware of operationally what's occurring on a day-to-day -day basis. They're aware of our, our, our hospital capacity. I don't see that we as council have the capacity at any level to establish that type of parameter. What I, what I would be advocating for would be for conversation that starts with hopefully a letter and then perhaps with the electives, but then ultimately evolved to Dr. Larson is the health official, the, potentially the EOC, and, and, and Tristan as the health department director to negotiate those parameters and, and what, what will work for the community. You know, because if we spike, we're not, I mean, it, it, the, the, there's no argument. I mean, if there's a surge, you know, what, what, what are the grounds for the conversation? And my my concern is in all every I agree with everything that's been said in in different ways, but I think that it, it seems like with what we're hearing, at least sort of what's being reported, not necessarily locally, but what it seems to be trending, is that we would you know we'd be I would I guess I would be very surprised if we didn't have a an uptick, a significant uptick uh, surrounding the holiday gatherings. So the timing is is kind of challenging in the sense that we're pushing the snowball uphill and we're saying we want some flexibility but we're about to you know it's going to start rolling back on us I think down the hill and and maybe you know maybe by the end of December it's a different situation maybe it's better maybe it's worse but I think it's it's a it's a moving target as we all know and I, I'm I guess the timing of the ask is a little it's like I'm imagining when they get the letter in Olympia, they're saying, okay, what do you know that we don't know? You know? And uh, like, well, we don't know how well, bad it's gonna be, but we wanna have some flexibility here, so. Yeah, well, we, I mean, yeah, nobody knows. I mean, that, yeah. I, I don't, yeah. I mean, I, I think the piece that I, again, I mean, we can we can either look at it in two weeks or we can do, I mean, I'm, I'm we're still gonna have the conversation with COG. Um, you know, I, I guess part of it is 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 my is anecdotal, right? A lot of our decision making is anecdotal. It, it, I'd like it to be a metric, but for whatever reason, I've been in a number of our restaurants, particularly recently, and they're working really hard to make it work. And there are a few of them that I've been into that have more than six foot spacing, math staff, spraying tables. So, so I guess that's the piece that, that I'm trying to work through in my mind. 
is we are putting the order puts significant numbers of people out of work in an industry that has worked incredibly hard to keep themselves and our community safe. And they can't control who's going to gather for Thanksgiving. They can't control who's going to travel. What they have controlled is their environment. And I think they've done it well. And so that that's my under and so do I have a metric? No. You know, I mean, has there been, you know, has there been a a, a positive trace back to a restaurant? I don't know. I mean, Dr. Larson may, or he may know better after he's through the C's or D's. <laughs> um, you know, but I mean, I guess that's the part that I'm grappling with. Honestly, folks, I mean, I mean, I, I, we can argue the numbers all we want, but if I look at our community, there's, there, there are significant sectors in our economy who have worked as hard as they possibly can to manage and control and keep their staff and themselves and our community safe. And I believe firmly that part of these. To, Mark, to Dr. Larson's point, the statewide restrictions are, are coming at us because of urban stresses that are not tied to the environment in which we are finding ourselves. You know, I mean, we still have nobody that I'm aware of in the hospital that's a positive COVID. But if you read the Seattle Times, the hospitals are are beginning to stress out yeah. on the west side. So, so, so I, you know, the cut, the, so the, the conundrum in a way, to me, is how do you separate what we're attempting to do in the community from the numbers that may not have anything to do with those that are being told they need, they are now restricted. I agree with you, and I think that it's the governor's office, I mean, in the context of our county grasping at straws, because what, what else could they do? Like you said, they can't change the behavior in people's homes. Um, so I don't think prior to a spike, I think it's completely irrelevant for our community. Post spike, anywhere we can eliminate people gathering without a mask on feels relevant. But how, I mean, there's no way to dictate when the spike comes and back to that should be controlled on a county by county basis. So I, I think that there's a lot of agreement here. I think it just comes down to some fine details on the direction that it's taken, but I would fully support a special meeting to discuss what those details are. So why don't, why don't we do it with this? Because it's getting to the point where I'm zoomed um, out. Um, David and I are both at our COG meeting on Wednesday. Um, and th this item will be on the agenda at the COG meeting uh, for their discussion. I mean, it could be that by the that COG looks at it and says, there's no way we're not, you know, I, we can't get agreement or whatever it might be. At which point it's a non-issue for us because I'm not sure that we would want to stake out individually as a city, and, and that could be another discussion. We could certainly have the COG meeting on Wednesday. I can work through John and Terry and do a special on Monday. Um, you know, and then the special can even be during the day. It doesn't have to be at night, you know, if that works better for people's schedule. It's just a special session that we would, we would with, the, with a single issue. At that point, theoretically, we would have, if COG's going to move forward, we would have the parameters of the letter we would also have the letter from the commissioners, all of which could be shared prior to the meeting so that we would have that. So rather than doing this verbally, I mean, and this is a great conversation, honestly, folks, I really appreciate people's willingness to put, put this stuff up on the table. Um, but we would have both the written word to, to, to respond to, if there were edits or changes we need, you, we could come into that meeting prepared to have that conversation. I would just add, uh, Bruce, that 
my expectation would be that the representatives from Clayell and Roslyn could have asked, well, particularly Roslyn and Clayell, and we're gonna wanna take it back to their councils before. Yeah, and I don't know what their schedule might be either. Yeah. Exactly, I mean, that's. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, yeah. I mean, I reached yeah. out to them this afternoon um, to just give them a heads up, but, but said that I would not, I don't know when their councils are meeting or how they wanna have that conversation with them. I think that sounds great. My only recommendation would be to bring a draft letter to COG that people can then, so that you don't run into the same situation. Um, I don't know yeah, if that comes so from the that commissioner. Might have, that that might have already that might have already happened. Okay, great. <laughs> with, with, <laughs> but without the without the semantic dancing at the end there, with you know, in terms of the the exemption, I think that's a good approach. I I, I don't. I think an exemption is going to get knee jerked out. Yeah. Uh, but I think if if you if I think if we could word it in a way that allows for, um, well, I had it earlier, but I think there's a way that that can be done. I yeah, I, I like your, I like your argument, Bruce. I think it's 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 good. Um, let's let's just see how it works out. Okay. I, again, I really, really want to thank everybody. I mean, it, it turned into a longer evening because of this conversation, but these are the, in certain ways, these are, these are the conversations we should be having. Um, and, and note again, that these are, these are happening in public, uh, in front of, and being streamed, um, so that, uh, people can hear and understand what we're thinking and where we're attempting and trying to go. Yeah. Um, any other comments or any other questions? I think we're, Good, Dr. Larson, anything from you? Okay, then um, let's call ourselves adjourned. Again, thanks everybody for the, for the conversation thoughts. Um, see you again. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Larson. Thank you.